The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of Time Warner Cable. Welcome to this month's edition of The Bottom Line. My name is Dana Connors, and I'm pleased to be your host for this program that's brought to you by the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. And as you have come to know, each month we take a look at some of the issues at work in our economy, some that are intended to help, others that may stand in the way of growing the economy. And in keeping with that theme, we'd like to acknowledge that as summer comes to an end and moves into fall, there is a date in the very near future that we all need to be concerned about. Of course, I'm talking about the election day on November the 8th. And for those of us in Maine, there's a lot to think about, a lot to take into account. We're going to be casting our vote for our new president. We have both congressional districts up for selection. We have 186 of our legislators. All of them will be finishing their current two-year term and will be selecting new. But add to that a bond issue for transportation, five referendum questions that the voters will need to take into account. Yes, there's a lot to consider, a lot that we need to know before we cast that ballot on November the 8th. Well, we're going to uh, take a look today at one of those referendum questions, and in my opinion, the one that's getting the least attention, but by all considerations, has, in my opinion, the greatest impact, both on the economy as well as education. It's not well understood. It clearly is not as simple as reading the question that would be for you on that special day. I have three guests that are going to help us explore the real issue behind the question, and I'm pleased to introduce them to you right now. I have Peter Onestis on my left. Peter is co-chair and owner of the Main Course Hospitality Group here in Maine, where he's located, but you can find his hotels as well as his restaurants throughout New England. We also have next to him Megan Sanborn, who at one time was a kindergarten teacher, but now is a coordinator of No on Two campaign. And we have my friend Ed Servone, who uh, you recently have read a report about our partnership in terms of looking to education and preparing our youth for either work or their career or their education that they're about to embark on. So I have three people here today from the private sector, from the campaign itself, and from the educational to help us look at that issue. Let's begin by looking at the question. When you go to the ballot box on November 8th on question two, this is what you're going to be asked to approve or reject. Do you want to add a 3% tax on individual main taxable income above $200,000 to create a state fund that would provide direct support for student learning in kindergarten through 12th grade public education? Pretty simply stated, and that's not our concern, we value education. We certainly can say that's a case to be made for more public funding. Our concern is what you're not reading when you're confronting that question. Our concern is what lies behind that question. There is much more to it than meets the eye. And that's where we begin this discussion. Peter, I'm going to turn to you first. You've had tremendous success. You've made a lot of investments in the economy, both here in Maine as elsewhere. I can't think of a better person to ask the question of the economic impact than you. How do you see this? What concerns you about this question? Uh, Dana, thanks, and thanks for having me. Um, I would think, if, if you, I can think of any way to sabotage the main economy, this might be one of the number one ways to do it. I mean, for years and decades, we've been trying to grow our economy, and there's so many ways to do it, and you can do it, but uh, and many states have done it. I mean, Nevada, Texas, Alabama, um, where they bring in BMW, they bring in Mercedes, they bring in Tesla, they bring in Samsung, Google, and they don't all have zero tax rates either. It's not that. It's that this tax would bring Maine from immediately at 10 point, it would take this a 3% surcharge, it would put us at 10.15%, the highest in the nation. And it's almost like throwing in the towel to ever 
not only get new business, but just to retain the people yeah. we have. I mean, whether it be Maine Med, whether it be a high-tech company, who is going to start a company or put a big facility here knowing that their highest paid executives would take it almost immediately as much as a 10% uh, reduction in their pay. Uh, so, for instance, in, in uh, Connecticut, uh, the governor down there is a Democrat, Daniel Malloy, who recently, they raised the tax from 5% to 6, 6.5, now 6.99. And what they found was that people were leaving. They had 105,000 people leave last year, and the similar thing happened in New Jersey. So he found himself in the awkward position of having to go to hedge funds and everybody else and beg them to stay, and then give them big tax breaks to stay. I mean, we all want more, in fact, his exact quote was, we've seen wealthy people leave uh, New Jersey when this happened. We don't want the same for us, something along those lines. We all want more money for education, but in the long run, if you have, a de if your ec economic base is not growing, you're declining. I mean, that's, it's just a given. You, we, and you get more money for revenues for everything, not just education, with a vibrant economy. Yeah. This it just kills our chances to expand. Well, and, and picking up on a point you made, I mean, th this is being characterized by those who support this, principally the Maine mm -hmm. Education Association of Teachers Union. Uh, who happened to also write it, they're saying, yeah, but it's just a few of the wealthy. But we lose too many of those so-called wealthy to begin with because Florida or New Hampshire are the benefactor to it. But when you look at the $200,000 and you consider that this is joint income, this is not an individual, and that small businesses who file as an individual a taxpayer, such as an s -Corp LLC, that is mm -hmm. not even though we don't want to lose anybody to any other state, this goes well beyond, quote unquote, the wealthy into those small businesses and certainly into joint income earners, the husband and wife who file jointly. That has to be an impact that's not even well understood, I would think. Absolutely, I mean, it's an, I mean not only is it just that, I mean, just the fact that a lot of those people will, from all things, from a heating and ventilation company all the way up to uh, the higher earners, it's, it's a lot of the people who create the jobs. I mean, I, mean, I know that's a, a worn out phrase almost, but, but it's true. And it's in my business, we're in the hotel business. I mean, just an example. I mean, a, a hotel company far larger than ours that started in Bangor, Maine, has been based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire now for years. And it's, why do we do that? I mean, why would we want to have people leave our state? Or why do we want to make it more difficult to retain the highest earners? And I'm not saying it's got to be zero taxes, but to go to the highest taxes in the, the country, country we're, yeah. just, we're just we're yeah. putting a big weight on our shoulders. Well, I like your term, not that I like it, but yeah. it tells a story that you kind of feel like you're thrown in the towel saying that uh, it really doesn't matter, when we right. know it really does matter. Megan, let's... There is a tax implication, economic implication, but even on the educational front, there are concerns that we all share. Can you speak to what this question supposes something, but in reality does something quite else? Can you, uh, can you speak to that? Sure. As a former teacher, I see a lot of concerns with this. Um, the proponent's argument is based on the foundation that zip codes don't matter, when in fact they do matter. My hometown of Wayne, Maine is among the 40% of communities that receive zero additional funding from this. There are 84 school districts that receive zero dollars if this passes. That's a big number and it creates a lot of unfair distribution that there already is. So it throws more money at a problem that already stands. The other problem is that behind the legislation, and in, if you look at it, the money can't be used for infrastructure, technology, or other classroom essentials. It's solely to be used for salaries of teachers and school personnel. That's interesting because in discussions with them, they point to the fact that this helps in with technology, classrooms, building repairs, when their own publicity speaks to the fact that that money derived from this question is required to be used for direct personnel costs, which are salaries by any other description. Right. And that's what you're saying in this instance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ed, you've, your organization establishes ed education as the highest priority, if you will. You bring together 
administrators at the school level, even teachers with the business community, and you plan to work towards the most productive education system possible to serve the economy, and yet you took a no position on this issue. Yeah, um, education is the most important investment we can make, and there certainly is need and a need to fund a, an education system uh, effectively, efficiently, and adequately. Um, we take a look at this starting from the kid, though, first. And what we're looking at is in Maine, we graduate 86, 87, 88 percent of our high schoolers, but only half of them can read or do math at grade level. And God forbid you be a poor kid because you're only reading, uh, 30 percent of those kids are only leaving high school ready to go. And so when we look at this question, we don't see how this money is going to address that and how just lumping it into the system blindly is going to help any of those kids who are falling behind, who need our help, and who are, quite frankly, our future. And we can't afford to let any person behind in this economy. We just don't have that many people. So we don't see this as a good investment. At the same time, I'm going to start this and realize that we've got a break in about a minute or so. And to continue, I'm going to stay with you, Ed, and that is uh, your organization is working to try to address the funding situation, and I know that because you've asked for our participation, which we gladly uh, appreciate being asked. What is occurring at this time? Not that it's a simple issue. I mean, the formula, the distribution formula is part of it, but can you tell us, the audience, what your plans are, how you expect to approach this, and where some of your thoughts are? Sure. I think one broad approach we're taking first, and I think it's important for the taxpayer, is the public education system isn't limited to K through 12. The public education system in this state starts at pre-K, and we have two exceptional uh, higher ed systems as well that public tax dollars go into, and that's for very good reasons. We want to give Maine people opportunity to succeed, reach their full potential, and be contributing members of this economy in our communities. So we have already this Blue Ribbon Commission that does have higher ed, K-12 folks on it. Um, I think it got off to a rocky start. I think a better approach would be to look at that, reset it, and say, you know what? It is time to relook at how we're investing our dollars from birth through adulthood for the benefit of Maine people and give that commission amount of time to get to the answers that people need to, to hear and have that debate it where it should be debated within a legislative setting where everyone has an opportunity to weigh in, to give their opinion, to present the facts, as opposed to a yes or no messaging campaign. Based on 20-second ads. I, exactly. Let's hold that thought. We're going to be right back after this uh, message. So please stay tuned. Welcome back. My name is Dana Connors, and I appreciate you staying with us for the break as we continue to look at the implications behind question two, reinforcing the point that it's not as simple as it may appear before you when you go to vote. I have three special guests, Ed Serbone from Educate Maine, Megan Sanborn, who is part of the coalition, and Peter Nastas, a businessman who's made many contributions here in the state. And together we're talking, trying to inform all of you about what we believe you need to know when that vote is cast. Ed, I want to continue with you for just a moment longer. When we left the discussion, you were talking about your position as Educate Maine, the importance to education, but also the implication of what's being worked on right now. Looking at the formula, look at the Blue Ribbon Commission and so forth, and the formula has been recognized by many as pretty outstanding. That's not to say it shouldn't be improved. And I think that's where we are today, recognizing that it has some value but it doesn't answer all of the needs of the state. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what the Blue Ribbon Commission is doing now is, is, is long overdue, is taking a look at this, looking at our needs, at the changing economy, the changing world, and is this formula doing all it can do for our kids? And that's really what the bottom line is, student achievement. Um, and what we're essentially doing is saying, fine, go ahead and study that, but in the meantime, we're going to make a drastic decision regarding funding without consultation, without a public venue for, for understanding what the different issues are. This is, you know, uh, uh, urban Maine, suburban Maine, rural Maine. We have local control. 
We have a variety of differences around the state that need to be acknowledged. And you're not going to just throw a bunch of money without accountability, without purpose, and without direction at it and expect that everyone's going to do better. That's, that's not a recipe for success in our mind. Well, and to your point also, one of the takeaways is that we all recognize that in the state of Maine, the needs that your school system is going to vary from school to school. Absolutely. So there has to be that flexibility and continuing to repeat the past we know that there's needs and inequities just doesn't you can't repeat the past with problems and expect a new future so. no no I mean a yeah. different outcome de really de uh, demands a different yeah. solution another issue I throw out there that I guess I would like invite anyone to respond to that I'm struck by and and correct me if my thesis is wrong but this question says we're going to create a special fund and that fund is going to be dedicated to this person well in my experience with the state at the, as a transportation commissioner now as the chamber, that is really faulty thinking because truthfully, the only one in my opinion that has the authority to apportion dollars and set priorities is the legislature. That special funds have no standing unless it's constitutionally provided. We've seen this play out with the lottery. We've seen it played out with the casino, even the 55 was passed by the public, but the point being the Constitution gives the authority to the legislature to determine its own priorities based upon the needs at the moment. And so this special fund that is pointed to is a special fund only in imagination. It's not going to be read. Those dollars are going to a general fund. The legislature will take it, sort it out to their priorities. That is their prerogative. They are protected by that provision. Tell me if that's wrong. Tell me if you see it that can I, way. Yeah, can I just say one thing on that? Because that's, to me, that's like a basic tenet of this whole uh, thing there. Is in 2003, when you say 55, for those who don't know, they passed a law that essentially 55% of the funding for schools had to come from the state right. or thereabouts. Um, that was a referendum 13 years ago. And I think I was reading the Center of Progress or someplace, but it said that it has never been done. Because just like this referendum, it goes into the general fund, and the legislature does what it wants right. with that money. And so if it's never been done, what makes us think this will be done? I don't know if the legislature doesn't have, have authorship on it or the fact there was no debate, which, Ed, you uh, so succinctly stated. But there's no guarantee by a long shot. In fact, it's, history says it will not go to exactly. where they say it's going to yeah. go. Or the casino, the lottery, and other examples uh, would be very much in play when it comes right. to education funding. No question about it. Megan, you agree with that? I do agree. The money from the three things that you just talked about, the money from all of those referendums was dedicated to education, and we've seen how that ended up. Yeah. And I don't see that this will be any different. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of what brings us together here. I mean, there's no question, and I need to admit that I should have at the outset, is that the chamber of commerce in the state. As a matter of fact, there's 25 other associations and local regional chambers that have come together that, that supports education, that understands its value to the individual but also to the economy, but says this is not the right answer. This is the wrong solution for education going forward. That doesn't mean we don't value education. To the contrary, our work is evidence that it is a high priority for us. So I gotta be sure that the public understands that our purpose today is to not to throw cold water on education, is simply to say that this proposal that was brought forward by the teachers union, by MEA, who wrote it, and now is the real outspoken proponent of it, is simply out there doing something that they believe may be right, but we're saying it's not the full story. There's a lot that needs to be told that the question isn't bringing forward. And that is our concern and the purpose of the show today. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, it's just some real short list of needs that the Chamber and us agree on is early childhood education is really important yeah. for the return on investment and success of the whole system. There's no avenue for early childhood within this law, and that's really short-sighted. We're looking at kids who have needs during the summer, after school, from low-income families. We got different schools who have trouble attracting teachers. I mean, there's some very real issues that are valid and out there, and this doesn't get to them. There yeah. is no accountability on this. There's a blank check, 
and trust us that this will fix itself, um, we would rather engage positively with educators who are at the core of this. They're, they're seeing what's happening, what the need is. We want to engage with them, with the families in those communities, and start trying to figure out where are the gaps in your community and how can we work together to figure out how to address those. Again, the important thing is the kid. And I think it's being lost a lot in this conversation is we really got to make sure that kids are coming out of this doing well, intact, and can go on to great lives. Yeah, no, I, I think that's well stated. Megan, yesterday when you, was it yesterday you were at the, um, at the meeting with the special committee? On Monday. Yeah, and uh, a lot is being said about flat funding since 2008, 2009. But I think what was really brought out at that particular meeting was that, and, and correct me if my impression is wrong, but the, the actual spending per student has gone up while the enrollment has really gone down so that there's a misplay on that. On even when you say flat, you have to take into account what the enrollment is and the fact that spending is actually increased per student. Yeah, what was pointed out by Susan from the Department of Education at the commission meeting on Monday was that expenditures are going up, spending per pupil is going up, but enrollment in all schools is actually going down and has been for the past five to ten years. You know, Dana, it's, um, people look to Massachusetts as the number one rated school system in the country. We're number 14. I mean, we're good, but we're not the best. Massachusetts' tax rate, highest tax rate is 5.1%, and they have a vibrant economy. We want to go to 10.15%. So my feeling, I mean, I think it should be obvious that that really puts a big stake through the heart of any growth, and growth is the main thing you need in the economy. In the end, I think the most important thing is remember, I think it will raise less money in the end. Maybe for a year or two, you'll, you'll get more, but you are just not going to be able to retain the, the leaders and the type of people you need to have. And then secondly, as we said, there's no guarantee to get, yeah. that the, the money is going to be allotted as spoken. Well, you, you say that. I recently heard a superintendent in addressing this issue to the, his school board say, this could well be a short-term gain for us, right. but I predict it'll be a long-term loss. And I think what exactly. he was really speaking to was the very point that you're making. And I will say, with the help of Jim Ryer, who is well respected by everybody who's a part of our team, he made it very clear to us that many of the positions and issues that we address, he guides us to that place because he understands education funding. It's not easy. And to your point, it's not something that you put to the public and expect a up or down, yes or no, 30-second soundbite. I can remember vividly, not that long ago, standing with the MEA and others yeah. saying it was on Tabor, which was an attempt to control spending. And we were standing at a press conference more than once together, side by side, saying tax reform is an issue that you should never decide in a referendum. It needs that discussion, that debate, that thorough understanding. That's the same as education. Those two are so alike, they are not to be resolved with a yes or no. There's too much at stake to do it that way. With that, we're going to wrap up this section. Believe it or not, it went that fast. And we're going to be right back with my closing comments right after this. Thank you for being with us today. This has been an important um, presentation to you from our point of view. I'm reminded as I reflect on what our guests have shared with us here today that those words and the wisdom of the late Paul Harvey when he said, you know, you need to understand the rest of the story. Well. In the eyes of MEA and those who wrote it, the teachers union, they would say that question two is very simple and very straightforward. But the truth is, it's anything but simple and straightforward. When you think of the impact that it brings to our economy and to our education, you can't help but be concerned as we are today. The question doesn't tell the full story. And that's what we've hoped we brought to you in this last half hour. You see, they talk only about the wealthy, that they can afford it's their fair share to pay. But the truth is, the real wealthy, if this is presented, we cannot afford to lose any more of them. They contribute to our economy in many different ways. But the truth is, $200,000 does not represent the true wealthy. Because please understand that this 
200,000 represents joint tax returns. The two spouses that, that pay their taxes will be affected by this. But maybe it's your 401k that you're depending on when you withdraw it. That is affected too. But 60% of those affected come from the small business, the people that provide us jobs and help our economy grow. They are your family-owned businesses, your S-Corps, your LLC. Now, this issue does hurt the economy. It hurts those who want to come to our state to invest. It hurts those who we need in our state, and professionals like medical doctors, technicians, you name it. We need those people. They're part of our future. We need them today. We can't afford to lose them. And when it comes to education, they say zip codes don't matter. We agree zip codes shouldn't matter. But in this proposal, they do matter. Because you see, as Megan pointed out, 85 communities get zero dollars. Do you think it's fair that a Cape Elizabeth, that Cumberland, that Falmouth, are those that get a lot of money while Greenville and other communities like West Bath, Machiasport get zero? No, 85, 85 communities getting zero while 12% get 60% of the money is not fair. And believe me, when they say it can be used for anything, read the fine print. It's to be used for direct personnel cost. And don't believe when they say that a special fund will protect it. This money goes to the general fund to be used as the legislature sees fit. That has been historically the case with lottery, with casino, and with other sources just like this. No, in our opinion, this question is misleading, it's confusing, it's unfair, and you know what? There are no guarantees. Oh, yes, there is. There is a guarantee that we'll be the highest tax rate, we'll have the highest marginal tax rate in the country. That's something this state doesn't need, our economy can't afford. That's why we bring this program to you today. We hope it has helped you reach a decision the same as ours. That's bottom line for today. As we move into fall, remember, fall's a wonderful place in the state of Maine. Please take the time to enjoy it. We'll see you next month.